Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this talented Indonesia Six Anniversary Special Webinar entitled Enhancing Performance with Data Driven Insight: Exploring the Potential of Analytics and AI in HR. By Srida Krishna from Entomo People Experience Advisor, partner at Excel Scale, Senior Executive AI and Public Policy. Let me introduce myself. My name is Adelina and I will be serving as your moderator today. First of all, I would like to thank for our audience here. Thank you for joining this webinar. I would like to greet some audience here. Let's see. Hello, Bapak Ruli Tamba. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining for, uh, with us today. I'm happy to join this webinar. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, great you uh, can, can come to our webinar today. Uh, Bapak Ruli Tamba boleh share dari perusahaan mana? Boleh perkenalan halo. dulu? Ya, yeah, halo. It's my halo. voice. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, I think Bapak Ruli is not good with the signal. Oke, okay. uh, hello Ibu Marina Dewi. Halo Mbak Adela. Uh, halo, Ibu Marina boleh uh, perkenalkan diri dari mana? Ya, halo semua. Saya perkenalkan, saya dari uh, Bang BJB Syariah. I see. Baik, terima kasih Bu Marina sudah hadir hari ini. Before we start, uh, I will introduce our speaker today, Mr. Sridhar Krishna. Uh, Sridhar is an esteemed professional with expertise in startup, analytic, AI, and AI platform. As a partner at Excel Scale, he empowers startup and mid-sized companies to achieve increased velocity and efficiency, enhancing their sense of success. He has also spent years leading, leading the platform from Europe when he was based in London. Sridhar's bring valuable insight is accelerating AI journey and driving growth. Before we start to the presentation, I will show the structure for today. There are three sessions of presentation. Each season will be held for 10 minutes and we will open Q&A for five minutes. If you are excited to ask questions, we will provide the time every after 10 minute presentation. Uh, and so prepare your question, okay? Uh, and now I would like to invite Sridhar to present the topic today. Please welcome Sridhar. Yeah, thank you very much, Adelina. It's a pleasure for me to speak to all of you in uh, Indonesia and uh, other places around, um, around Southeast Asia who have joined today. And um, I'm, I'm Sridhar Krishna, as Adelina mentioned. I have, um, I used to be a managing director at Accenture where I was leading our analytics platforms. So it's a topic of great interest to me. And, uh, and, and I see AI today as an extremely important subject. And uh, we want to be able to uh, go through this and, but specifically we're going to focus on how AI can be used in, in, um, HR, and, and that's the topic for today in terms of how do you enhance performance with data-driven insights. We're looking at specifically about the potential of analytics and AI in HR. So when I um, look at, um, oops, okay. So today, if you, if you see the leaders, when we talk about art, AI, artificial intelligence, Many leaders are, are, are talking about AI. A large number of people are thinking about implementing AI in their organizations. So it's critical that all of us who are assembled here today, I mean, from the HR fraternity, uh, to understand that it's important for us to join the AI revolution. And the question really is, are you all ready to join that? You know, 82% of the leaders believe that AI will enhance performance. 94% think that it's critical to their success. And a large number of people have already started implementing a little bit of it, right? So the question is, are you ready both from the, the companies that you represent as well as 
from as individuals, right? So do, are you personally prepared to take advantage of what AI brings to all of us today? So what I've done, as Adelina mentioned, is I've broken up today's presentation into three parts. One is going to be about the evolution of AI itself. Like how, how is it, how do we find ourselves in this place today where we're all talking about AI, right? So how did, what are all the things that happened over the last 100 years in order to get us to this point? The second part is I think very specific around how, what are the various uses of AI in HR? What are the companies which are using them? How can they be implemented? What does it mean for individuals who are working in that space? What skills are required and so on. The third part is about how to begin your AI journey. What are the steps that you need to take? Yes, now if you're convinced that AI is important and you believe that AI can be used in HR, do you know how to start? What do we do first? What are the second, what do we do next? And so on, so that we can help you to help, uh, start off on your AI journey. That's, that's what we want to do. So the first section I'm coming to now is about the evolution of AI. So before we go into AI itself, I want to talk about how human beings, how all of us take decisions, right? So if you look at it right from the time when we were babies, we asked for food when we were hungry. We cried when we were uncomfortable. How did we do that? We did that out of instinct, right? That is the first way by which we took decisions, just instinct. You're born, you know what to do. The second thing that we do is when we observe the world around us, we look around, we see what happens, you see, you see a tree, you see a plant, you see it's growing, it's green. You know that trees are generally brown and green. You, you get that kind of knowledge. You understand the difference between colors just by observing that something looks a little different from another and so on. So we learn by observing. The third, then we go to school, then we go to university and we get specific knowledge about each of the things that we know. Once we understand, science better, we understand history and what happened in the past, we have some lessons about how we should take decisions in the future. Then we go to work and we find out that what we learned in school and university has little application and the world is very different. And in reality, you have to do things differently. You learn that. So through experience, you understand what you need to do a little different in order to be effective. Then finally, you look at data, right? So today, overarchingly, now you see lots of people taking decisions using data because data tells you whether uh, some, this is the trend. If you've been selling $500 uh, million worth of some product last year, you, don't be you believe that you will do about $500 million this year. Or maybe you will do $550 million. Maybe you'll do $600 million. You're not going to do $5 million you're not going to do 5 billion, right? I mean, you think that's what you, you understand and you do. So basically you look at instinct, observation, learning, experience and data is how all of us have been taking decisions, right? So that's human beings. Now, when we talk about analytics, today a lot of people are talking about analytics, using data, visualization and so on. Now, this is not, something that happened in the 20th, 21st century, right? This has been something that people have been using for years, even before this. In 1854, so this chart I've shown you is an interesting, interesting map, right? But I think in 1854, there was a cholera outbreak in London. Yeah, everybody understands what cholera is, right? I mean, you have, uh, suddenly you, you lose a lot of water, you have, um, and, and, you, and you can even die. It's a very serious disease if it's not treated, but if it's treated, it's very easy to survive. So it's like that, right? Now, suddenly there was this cholera outbreak in London and thousands of people were dying and nobody knew how to stop it. It just was spreading all over. It was just spreading and lots of people were dying. So then there was this doctor and at that time people believed that cholera spread through the air. 
But Dr. John Snow, who was there, who was a physician at Soho in London at that time, was able to figure out that this is not because of air. I think it is more than that. So what did he do? He took a large map and he started map pointing, uh, putting down, uh, put a dot for every person who died or got cholera in that region. He did that. With that, they were able to figure out that most of the deaths are happening in a 500 meter radius of one municipal pump, water pump on the corner of Broad Street. With that, he was able to figure out that the source of the cholera was from that pump. They dug in and they found out that there was a soiled nappy, which was there, of a child who had got cholera somewhere at some time, some, in some other place. And that was contaminating the water, spoiling it, and people were getting cholera. They, with use of analytics, he was able to identify which pump was the source of the outbreak. So that was one. But you also understand that it's very hard to do this, right? You can't obviously take a pen and pencil and keep noting down. And it's it'll take a long time for something like as important as this, they were able to uh, do something. But for other reasons, it's hard to do. So therefore, they started looking at, now with what happened, in the last 50, 100 years, we've been having computers. Then storage was expensive, right? Initially, storage of data was expensive and you could not, anybody could not do much analysis. Even though technically you could do it, it was very expensive and hard to do. But now storage has become cheaper. You can do cloud computing. So computing has become, computing powers that we have today are phenomenal. When I started, when, when I had my first computer, I had bought a computer in 1990. At that time, uh, the computer had a 4 MB, not, I'm telling you, MB, right? 4 MB RAM and a 20 MB hard disk. So it, and it was more expensive than the computers that we buy today. With like, I have a computer which has got a, a 16 GB RAM and a, a one terabyte hard disk, right? So, and, and it costs only as much as that. So the cost of computing, the cost of storage and new software, earlier we could only use a spreadsheet or something, or I had to write programs using, first time I did analytics was in 2002, when I had to actually write a program to do the statistical analysis using SQL and all that. So, but now with R and Python, et cetera, it's now become trivial to be able to create uh, analytical models. So therefore, analytics has become very popular. Every company is using analytics today and data scientists are amongst the most sought after professionals in this job market, right? Everywhere you go, people want a data scientist. So that is what has happened. But when we talk about data and analytics, everything is not the same. You start off doing simple things like descriptive analytics, where you're doing, you, you take some simple business decisions, looking at um, trends, you look at distribution, you look at dispersion, you look at all this and understand what has happened in the past, right? It just gives you a sense of this is what happened yesterday, this is what happened last year. This is how my, this is the difference between the various salespeople on my team, how much they sold and so on. You look at data and you get some descriptive analytics. You describe the situation. Then you go one step further and you start doing what is called diagnostic. You are trying to, it is not enough to know why there was more sales in one area and less in another, or why one type of person is doing well. And it is not enough to know that some, one group of people are performing well and another group of people are not performing well. You do diagnostic analysis to find out why that happened. You slice and dice the data. You look at it in different ways and then say, hey, this is why I think it happened. You do root cause analysis and all that to come up with diagnostic analysis. Then you do predictive data, but, that's, but you want to know what will happen tomorrow. You, don't, you already know what happened today. Now you know why it happened. 
but you want to know what's going to happen next year. That's where you come up with predictive analytics, where you're building predictive algorithms. You do some uh, regression, you, you make, build regression models, you build some decision trees, you do all that to come up with predictive models, which can help you forecast. Then you go at, look at prescriptive. It is not enough if you know what will happen tomorrow. Now you want a different outcome. What is the use of knowing that there is this truck coming in front of me, it is going to bang into me. You want to know what I should do to change that. I want my car to move aside. When you're building a, an AI based car, you want it to sort of avoid the collision. So that's where you have things like prescriptive models and you apply the knowledge that you have gained to effect the change, right? So that's what this is about. Now, I want to do one quick thing um, before uh, we go ahead. Uh, I want to know, um, I want you to be able to say, uh, one second, I, yeah. I want you to like uh, scan this, uh, uh, QR code, which is there, or if you can open your phones and go to this uh, URL, which is listed there, ahaslides.com slash HRAI, um, then you can go and answer the question, which is given to you there. Adelina, can you help them to sort of get to that? Yeah. Okay, sure. Sridhar, why? Yeah. Silakan Bapak Ibu uh, boleh di scan QR code-nya. And once you go there, I would like everybody to say Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, I think uh, the link is limited exceeded. Sorry. Uh, the link is on maximum capacity. Couldn't be accessed by uh, audience. Oh, um, oh. Okay, uh, so I'm able to join uh, this link. Yeah. Uh, can you back uh, to... Uh, the QR. Uh, they say the the limiting exceeded. Okay. All right. Um, I have not yet. Okay. So somebody has typed a smart system to think like a human. So if most people are not able to type, then I will move on. Yeah. Bapak Ibu yang belum bisa mengakses QR-nya boleh di uh, kolom chat saja menjawabnya. Terima kasih. Ya, yeah, Om, it looks like only seven people are able to do this. Huh? Well, that's strange, Sridhar. Um, okay. All, it's all right. So I think we've got some definition. Somebody says human-made intelligence like a machine. And uh, somebody says it's human-made intelligence to think and act like human. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so everybody is talking about artificial intelligence as being something that's human-like, right? I think uh, that's that's good. So now let's just go on with the with this presentation. So when I look at, there are many definitions to artificial intelligence. Okay, um, and the one which I like. Is, uh, is this by Marvin Mensky. He was founder of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's AI lab. And he said something which is similar to what people have written, that there are, it's been tasks which are done by machines, right? If it was done by a human being, you'd say, hey, that required intelligence to do. 
Like for instance, if you're able to distinguish between a human being and a dog or a human being and a cat or a dog and a cat, all, the, all that requires intelligence, correct? I mean, if you're able to drive a car and uh, avoid collision, avoid an accident, that requires intelligence. If you are able to look at uh, uh, resumes and figure out if this person has the skills that are required for this job, that requires intelligence, correct? So these are all the things that could be done. And before I go any further, I want to know, I want to stop Adelina and see if there are any questions, then we can sort of continue on to this section, yeah? Okay, uh, there is some question related to evolution of AI. Okay. Um, uh, there is a question from at Pramudia 98. Uh, and the question is, what makes the evolution of AI improve rapidly? Yes, I think you will just see that in the next couple of slides that I've got, where I'm going to sort of talk about the technologies that came in and how that changed things. At the same time, both from a hardware perspective and also the software that came in. Those are the two things that sort of made things different. And there are some specific technologies that made a huge difference to the way things are. Yeah, I'll come down to that. Any other questions? Uh, I think uh, we need to uh, move to the next presentation first. Okay, fine. So, so let's look at the evolution of AI, right? So I talked about generally about data, the use of data, et cetera, but now we are coming really to the evolution of AI itself. And if you, it had started off in the 1940s when during World War II, there was Alan Turing working in to try and break the code uh, that Germans were using to uh, transmit, right? So they were capturing that code and they're trying to break the code and they realize that it's very hard to do it manually and you need computers. And Alan Turing started using some of this technology a machine. He started experimenting with machine learning at that point in order to do this, right? So the first digital computers started off around in the forties. And then, then they developed something called a robotic mouse. They created a robo and they predetermined paths they created and said, okay, and the robo was taught how to go in that path and repeat it. Every time it would go in that path, which was prescribed for it. So they were able to make that, uh, uh, that happen. Then I think people started studying human brain and human behavior and understood about, they created artificial neural networks. People understood that the human brain is all about neural networks and they created a artificial neural network and this artificial neural network, the first thing it could do was, if you see, if you take a bunch of cards in which on the top left, something was written and another group of cards in which something was written on the top right, it was able to say, okay, this one has some data on the top left and this one has some data on the top right. It was able to distinguish between white and black. It was able to look at some markings and identify that, okay? So that is what happened next. That was the perceptron mark one. Then somebody developed a software. Then there was a, what is known as an AI winter. From 1960, 65 onwards to about 1990, there was hardly any development in AI because initially there was a lot of promise that AI gave and companies invested in it. And they found that they didn't have the, amount of data that was required. They didn't have the computing power. They didn't have all those things which allowed them to do much with it, right? So they realized business application of AI is going to be very little. For about 20 odd years, nothing happened. It is known as the AI winter. Only a few defense labs in the US were doing some small work in that space, but after largely very little was being done. Then in the 1990s, somebody came up with this game, uh, this software, which could play this game backgammon at a very high level and even beat uh, good players, right? It was just below the human, top human players could beat it, but 
most of us would lose to the uh, software. Then I think IBM came up with this uh, Deep Blue, which uh, did this played chess against, uh, famously beat uh, Karpo or Kasparov on chess. I think th that happened. Then, but in, in the tw after 2010 was when there was a lot of development in AI. And there was this whole product called AlexNet, which was developed. And they came up with this concept of deep learning and how deep learning works and how they were able to recognize images of dogs and cars at near human level, right? So that made a huge difference. Then, uh, then came artificial intelligence with language, image recognition, et cetera. All that came in and now that has changed, right? So if I look at zoom in from 100 years that I talked about earlier to the last 20 years where there's been tremendous development, it happened, I think there are a few technologies which are very important. And, uh, and that is what made all the difference, right? So if you look at it, deep generative models were created. So this VAE stands for Variational Auto Encoder. Now, this does things like it can encode distribution and regularization, regularized, uh, it can, it, it could do encoding distribution and it could regularize it during the training to generate new data. So it was able to create fresh content, right? It could write things, it could draw things, it could create things. And then the generative adversarial networks, those are the GANs. These are the two most critical technologies that were developed. And these based on this, these are basically based on machine learning models, one type of machine learning which came up with these. But using this, a whole lot of new things happened. Then they came up, then Google came up with AlphaGo and AlphaZero. AlphaZero could play chess. AlphaGo could do something, uh, could play this game called Go. And they became world champions. They were better than humans, right? Because what it did was instead of instead of deep blue and all that, which looked at the playing statistics of various players, they looked at the games that various chess players played and then compared that and then made this software as good as the best chess player. Instead, Alpha Go and Alpha Zero were about teaching the rules of the game to the AI and letting the AI generate its own games and integrate its own data and then using that to learn. And they came up with ideas that even human beings had never thought of, approaches that human beings had not even thought of. So that was a big success. And after that, then came this whole GPT and the chat GPT, which all of us are now talking about, which is about uh, pre-trained uh, transformers. And so these things allowed us to um, make AI now accessible to all of us. Till recently, it was only in the sort of big labs with big, you needed supercomputers. But at the same time, cost of computing came down, cloud computing became big. So as a result of all this, we are today in a position to play, do much more with AI than we were in the past. Yeah. So if I'll just look at some of these pictures, right? So if you look at the picture on the top left, where we're talking, it's, it's very grainy. It looks artificial. It does not look like a picture of a real person. But by 2017, this technology, deep learning had become so good that like, you know, the images became between a real person and this. All these are AI generated images, right? These are not pictures of real people. These are AI generated images. And now, today, in 2022, for instance, you, it can distinguish between a Pomeranian and a Pomimon. It can say, you can say things like a Pomeranian sitting on the king's throne, wearing a crown, and two tiger soldiers standing besides it, and it is able to make an image like this, right? Which is so sort of real and, and clear. So those are the kind of things that uh, today uh, AI is able to do which it was not able to do in the past. So can I pause for some questions, Adelina? Okay, thank you, Sridhar. 
in the first uh, session is how evolution of AI in the thousand era is the AI cell form handwriting recognition until today become language understanding. In business, data itself can uh, start from descriptive, uh, like company just gathering data and etc. And descriptive data will be analyzed analyzed to find out why. And we can use data to make predictive analysis based on that pattern. But uh, and in AI, uh, in uh, evolution of AI, uh, in the end of analyzing, uh, analyzing the data, we can apply the result for knowledge, if there is a change or not after we apply that strategy. Uh, for the next, uh, we have a question uh, from uh, our social media yesterday. It's about uh, evolution of AI. Is it really necessary for us to use AI in organization despite not very much uh, user? Yeah, I think, first of all, I'm not uh, sure that we are right in saying that the uses are limited. Yeah, I think it is early days. And there is a lot of applications mm -hmm. and there's a potential to use AI. And that's what we're going to talk about, about the potential for AI. I want to give a simple example. In Canada, a survey was conducted in the 90s. They compared companies in the 90s, which used computers, right? At that time, yeah. computers were the big thing. They looked at companies which used computers and uh, more effectively. And they compared them with other companies in the same industry, which did not use computers so much, right? In those days, in the 90s, you could not do a lot with computers, but like you could do some things. Now, companies which were at the front end of technology were 30 to 40% more productive than those companies which did not use technology in a big way, right? At that time in the 90s, they found that there was an advantage of 30% over, over 10 years, 30% difference in productivity. Maybe they spent more money than they gained out of it. I mean, somebody can say that, right? But between 2000 and 2015, companies that use technology more, companies that started using data and analytics, et cetera, and all that, they have become three times as per So the difference now is quite high. So that is number one. The second thing is that you can, you may believe today that you don't have many applications, but if you start using it a little bit, you start reading about it, you start being aware of it, the you will be at an advantage over people who have not done it. When AI comes in and if like some, if you understand it well, you can take advantage of it. If you don't understand it, you might get disrupted. AI is a disruptive technology. The way to deal with disruptive technology is you get ahead of it, you learn about it and you work using it. You become capable of doing it well, then you benefit from it. But if you are going to be a mute spectator, and saying, yeah, let us see when it gets what they do with it, then you will find yourself not very relevant. So I think it's important to know about AI from that perspective. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you, Sridhar. Uh, I think the other question is uh, related to HR. So I think uh, we need to move to the presentation first. And then okay. uh, let's go to the sure. next question. Okay. Sure. Please continue, Sridhar. Yeah, so I think again, if people, I think like our uh, QR code thing is not working very well. So I'm not going to uh, ask people to do this again. But essentially, I wanted people to know what are the, so do, do some people want to try? I mean, like uh, just using it, even if five, six people are able to use it and say something, I'm happy to uh, share my screen and uh, see what people are uh, saying. So my question here is, what are what do you think are potential uses of AI in HR? Where do you think we can apply AI in HR? Same problem. 
some participant are typing. Yeah. Uh, but here in text uh, in column chat uh, there are some answer. Uh, Abdullah Emil Pamudia say in selecting the preferred candidate and potential another I'm potential. Not I'm not seeing it up. Okay, that's good. Okay. In selecting perfect candidate, okay. Predict turnover, managing organization, predict manpower planning, data analytic, or analyzing some trends. Identify talent, okay. Screening. Okay. Yeah, very good for eliminating clerical work, for placement, for talent, screening candidates, hiring process. I think very good uh, suggestions. And I think if we go into our uh, slides, we'll find out more, right? So my view is this, technology can disrupt, right? Technology can disrupt how we do our tasks, right? They may change the way we do them. Sometimes they may even change what we do. But the objective of doing it for business will not change, right? If you are in HR, what are your tasks? You want to be able to recruit the right candidates and deploy them on their jobs. You care about performance management. You want to make sure that performance is checked, how people are doing, help them improve performance. You want to make sure that there is learning and career management, new skills are acquired by people, new training, what, what training should you give to different people, so on. You want people and the team to be engaged. You want them to be motivated and driven to give best performance. And you want to retain your best people in the team. You don't want to lose your best performance. You want to hold on to them. That is really what HR is about. And that does not change whether we do AI or not. But when I look at some of the key questions that we are looking at in HR, one problem is there is not enough supply sometimes there or there are many people with some skill and there is very little demand, mismatch between that. Then people accept an offer and then they don't sort of join. Then you have stuff that site recruitment takes a long time. Then there are some performance management is difficult to do. It's difficult to compare performance of different people. How, what is the right incentives to give? How do you do rewards and recognition? What skills do people need? To, when you've sent people for training, you don't know if that training was useful or was it just a waste of time? Did everybody just go have some good lunch and come back? Or did they learn something useful? Uh, what are, if you know that tomorrow these are the skills that are required, how do you train people to acquire those skills? Then how do you get people to be in the company telling you, giving you advice, giving you suggestions, and how do you sort of take that? You want to know what do people think of your company? Are they happy here? Do they think it's a fair place? Is it a good place to? Or is it a place where the atmosphere is not good and so on, right? Um, can you all hear me, Adelina? It's all clear? It's all clear. Yeah, thanks. Then it's about attrition and retention management, etc. In all these areas, they have found that analytic AI can be used in varying degrees, right? In all these areas, I believe that we can use AI, but I'm going to give you some examples which are a little more specific, right? So people talked about screening, and I think it's a good idea on candidate screening, very important part. So if you look at before AI was used, what do people do? They read every resume application that has come. Then they compare it with the job description. They look for keywords. Does it say Java? Does it say Python? Does it say something else? You look for that. And that is very 
It is expensive because you need lots of people to do this. And because the people who are doing screening are often not technology people themselves or from the business, uh, quality of screening is also not very good. You give CVs to the people who are going to interview and they say, I don't like any of these CVs. The fitment is just not good. So that is something that would happen in the past. But with AI, there is a difference. Now you look at the funnel, it is like this, no? Now with AI, you can narrow the funnel right at the top. So you narrow the funnel right at the top and reduce the total time taken to hire people. You're able to, the tool is reading the resumes. It understands context. It can understand that if somebody says, I know R, they also think that, yes, it's not going to be so hard for this person to learn Python. It, it knows that if this person has done this kind of work, it means if somebody says I'm a data scientist, they also know that it's not very different from being an analytics, if you've done analytics. So it can compare, it understands context. It can understand that. It can compare with the job description more effectively. It can look beyond keywords. It can do in a matter of minutes what people would take days to do, right? So it's inexpensive and it reduces time to hire. That is the advantage. And I gave an example of a company called Stanford Healthcare, where it, it actually, you know, whenever you go into a website today, it's very hard to not come across a chatbot. A chatbot is always there asking you, okay, how can I help you? And so on. Now, this these people use the chatbot very effectively. They help when a candidate goes there and gives them, it asks them some basic questions. Using those answers from those basic questions, it was able to figure out what are the jobs for which they would be suitable. It was able to match the candidate and the job more effectively. And therefore, it made applying easy. Applying for the job was also made simple. And, uh, and then it was able to come, they created a customer relationship management tool, CRM tool, and they were able to communicate with this person, keep track of all the communication that was going on. And all this was happening with the chatbot, and it was able to sort of significantly reduce the increase the number of candidate visits to the website. It increased, it got some 35,000 unique visits, 11,000 plus candidate leads were obtained through this process, and 12,000 apply clicks were made. So, this was so significant for Stanford Healthcare that they are doing this in a big way, expanding it to areas outside of it. So I think there was a question earlier about some companies who use it. I know that for a fact that Amazon, Google, and many other large companies are, are using AI, especially for uh, resume screening is a very, very useful application. I think in the past also it has been done, but they did it using keywords. But now it's much beyond that. It's the whole job description is all you have to do. And it will figure out whether these things match or not. Yeah. So that is, that is one. Um, the next example I give is about attrition and retention. People have always, HR professionals have always been very interested in predictive models, which can predict when a high performer is about to leave. Now with the amount of data that AI can look at, compared to what you can do with normal analytics, the amount of information that you have makes these models more accurate. AI can even go through, already organizations read people's email. The computer reads to make sure that you're not sending sensitive information outside the company and so on, right? So while they're doing this, they can look at the tone. They can understand not just the words, but also the tone of the conversation between the client and this person and or between employees, between the supervisor and the, and the, and the employee. And they're able to use all that information to figure out who is more likely to leave. It can also suggest that like, you know, hey, there are uh, some specific retention actions you can take for this person. Maybe you have to give this person more money. Maybe that person needs a different boss for him, for her to be happy and successful. They can look at facial expressions in your office. They can look at the tone in which you speak to your customer and understand whether you're likely to leave or whether you're, happy, you're going to stay longer. 
right? So I think those are the kind of examples I have. Similarly, with performance management, Earlier, we always looked at data for performance management. You know, you looked at, okay, if uh, how many units of a particular uh, product that you produced, what was the quality of the code you wrote, or like, you know, how many barrels of oil you shipped or anything, right? So it was all relied on data. But despite that, um, uh, the data that we were looking at was not so much, you know, Therefore, the manager's input was much more valuable. So you have a performance discussion and the manager really decides whether this person should uh, get a higher increment or should get more money or should you get a promotion and so on. Now, AI can provide much more objective analysis by analyzing emails, by analyzing and a good complete 360 degree view of performance in a way that it is difficult for human beings to collect. I think AI can do all those things and it can reduce time for performance analysis, which means the biggest advantage in my opinion is, right now we do performance analysis once a year. Instead, you can do this many times a year because not just for increasing pay, but for giving people feedback so that they can improve their performance. Right? As in performance management, one of the most important tasks is to improve performance. It is not only to judge performance and say somebody is good, somebody is not good. It is to improve performance. And that is where I think like, you know, uh, performance management uh, is where AI can help. It can also provide training plans and job rotation suggestions and so on. So I think that's something that it can do. Help desk is another very interesting area. You have chatbots and instead of having people sitting and answering questions about the policy, HR policy of a company. Can I, am I eligible to more vacation time? Can I take this? Will I get loss of pay if I take this time off? Can I apply for a new role in another geography? Can I go and work somewhere else? Can I get a new boss? All this kind of work, I think uh, it is shown that it can do significantly uh, beneficial if more, more people than not believe that service teams with AI are much more beneficial than not um, uh, when it comes to uh, chatbots and other AI use for help desk. Because it can take all the law and also it takes time to train a new person into this help desk, right? Because that person has to understand all the policies of the company. It's very easy with a chatbot. It can like quickly learn and you can, it can scale it up as you increase the number of people in the team. You can scale up and do this well. So I think that was the kind of advantages. There are many other things. It can create a job description based on how, what kind of work people are doing. It can even help a candidate uh, do things like interview questions. Now, right now, interviewing is done by humans, but it can even do some research for you and give you some good interview questions. It can create some problems which for the candidate to solve. It can make suggestions in certain kind of manufacturing areas, et cetera. It can even pro protect against accidents. It can tell you what you need to do different uh, and uh, reporting. So those are areas that it can do. Any questions? I think we have, we're running out of time. So I want to sort of make sure that if there are questions, I'll take them. Any questions, Adelina? At this point. Yes, yes. There is so many questions, and <laughs> I think, uh, Miss Najla, are you here? Hello, Miss Najla Azarin. You can uh, ask question directly to Sridhar, maybe. Can you open your camera and ask your question? Or Miss Chacha, Miss Chacha Anisa, are you here? Yes. Hello. Okay. You can ask question directly to say that. Hello. Yeah, tell me. Okay. Hello, Mr. Srida. Hello. Okay. Uh, actually, there are a lot of questions for me, but 
uh, maybe I could ask you for only one uh, question that is okay. uh, a bit crucial. Sure. So, um, in the context of data-driven decision making, how can we recognize and address the potential biases in the utilization of analytics and AI technologies? And how can we ensure that implemented systems not only optimize employee selection and evaluation process, but also remain attentive to fairness, equality, and inclusivity to create a diverse and inclusive work environment that values the unique contributions of each individual towards achieving overall organizational success. Maybe that's... Yeah, uh, yeah I think data bias is a very interesting uh, problem, right? I think what happens with AI is that you take all the old data sets and you look at uh, what kind of people have been successful in the past or who's more likely to be hired. And such biases can easily come in. If let's say you're hiring in America and you hire, you find that white people have been hired in the past, then you might find that you're unfair to black people because they don't get hired, right? Because in the past, the, can, the, the it has been so. So I think it's important to uh, hide those, to remove those biases. So what some company, I was just looking for some example, which I saw, I was just reading, and it talked about in recruitment, what they did was they looked at candidate questions that you asked the candidate and also masked the, they hid the information about that candidate's race, gender, age, et cetera, was, was hidden. And only questions about, like it, they ask the questions on what is the skill, what is the ability of this person, what is the experience of this person in a particular thing. And using that, they were able to uh, take decisions. And then afterwards only you get unmasked about what is the person's uh, ra uh, racial race or gender, et cetera. So it's about AI, if it's not, trained properly on the right data sets, it can bring a lot of bias. The human bias will get repeated, but with AI, you can actually understand the human biases that exist and prevent that from affecting your decision by blocking out that such information while doing uh, selection. That is something that AI can do. And I think it's all about uh, the data sets that you create, the uh, biases that you know which exist, and how do you remove for certain biases by reducing the importance of certain variables and, and then take decisions. That's how it works. I hope I answered your question. Okay. Hello, Chacha. Yes, very well, sir. Thank you so much uh, for the explanation. And I think I agree that this may also uh, significant impact privacy uh, from the EA, which remains a concern for, uh, for maybe some professionals to ensure continuous development that remains relevant to the company's need and fosters a well-functioning organization. I agree. I think like, you know, countries are dealing with this problem differently. Uh, the European Union is focusing a lot more on AI regulation, while the US and UK are looking at um, AI innovation. So there is always a, 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 a compromise between innovation and regulation, which is taking place. And today, I think um, maybe my, my personal view may be that, you know, we need more innovation today and we will come up with regulation uh, in the next few years. But, um, but I do see the importance for regulation at this point also, yeah. Thank I've you so much. Thank you. Hey, I've, uh, Adelina, I've got a couple of slides on this AI journey I'd like to cover before we sort of wrap up. Should I go there? And then we can take any questions afterwards. Okay, sure. Please continue. Okay. Um, so I think how to get started on your AI journey. 
I think I wanted to do this uh, survey again, but I'm not going to do that. We don't have much time. But I think there are four things which are important, right? One is you must have business goals that you want to achieve. You must know what are the key business problems in your company that you want to solve for. Not every company has the same problem. Some companies have different problems. So I think it's important to know that. But you can't do any of this without having the right data. If you don't have good data, if you don't have a process for collecting the data, you don't store the data properly, clean the data properly, then the information and the data bias that we just talked about, how do you account for that? I think knowing the value, importance of all those things is important. Then you come up with the use cases. How can you have a specific use case? Let's say uh, HR resume screening, or is it about performance management? Or is it about attrition prediction? You use those use cases. You try the ones which for which you have all the data. And then most important is you also need a platform and the people with the right skills in order to do this AI, go on this AI journey, right? So some of the big barriers for adoption have been your data is in like, you know, individual silos. Uh, the marketing data is not available to production, not available to finance, not available to HR. Uh, the data quality is suspect. You know, some data is complete. Some columns are empty. Uh, access to data is not available for everybody. Um, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, H, uh, then about then there is the data is very old. Therefore, it is not very useful. And most importantly, you don't have analytic skills in the company. Therefore, you can't get things done. And uh, there are different types of data and you need to approach them differently. There could be internal data. How do you make sure that this internal data is centralized and stored and it's available to the right people when they need it? You have a lot of external data is available today, which gets used. How do you identify which data is useful for your organization and contract with the right places to collect that information? Then if you look at data today, there is structured data, which is numbers, letters, et cetera. And there is unstructured data, which is now even more easy. It is possible to analyze today, unlike in the past, images, voice, uh, et cetera, and that kind of data. And synthetic data, sometimes you have to create data. Machine learning models often need lots of new data, and they need to be able to create new data, synthetic data, in order to do build some models. So I think how you handle each of these is going to be important. And you need a platform that's secure and you have outcome focus. It should be agile because today's application is different from what tomorrow it will be used for. It needs to be able to connect to different data sources. You should work with a platform that comes up with AI expertise and provides you value for money because I think it can become very expensive if you go to the wrong platform. Uh, and uh, when I look at our engagement model, it starts off with identifying roles, access levels, key business questions, the idea of what, like, where can this, where is data available, quality of the data, building those AI models, validating and refining, and then implementing this whole analytics journey. So this is overall what you have to do. You've got to know your use cases. And I think if you want to do something simple, it's about knowing your business goals and uh, having the data and then like being able to uh, know the use cases and then uh, platform and skills. So I think uh, on behalf of Entomo and uh, Talent Fit Indonesia, I'm very happy to have presented this and I'm open for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Srida. Uh, there is uh, so many questions uh, right now. I want maybe to I can stop sharing maybe, yeah? Okay, sure. And I can see more faces. Okay. Uh, can I call Pak Septiono Kurniawan? Are you here? Okay, then I will uh, read the question. How can analytic and AI help HR department predict and reduce employee turnover uh, red suite within an organization? I think I just answered that question. I gave an example of how uh, an organization uh, can use the data that is there about the person, the person's, uh, you collect external data about how much somebody of that position and skill 
earns in other companies. You have information about how, when was this person last promoted? You have information about all that, right? So basically some information about the employee, you have some information about the external environment. But today you also have information, you know, in the corridors in the office, you have uh, cameras which see what is the facial expression of the person. Is this person happy? Is this person unhappy, right? You can also make up things like when they're talking, when they have like conversations, how is their tone of tone, which is there. Oh, yeah. Many of those things can be captured and analyzed anonymously. And you don't have to look at specific data for someone, right? But it can be analyzed. Yeah. And then you can offer that information to the HR person and say, hey, here is this person who I think is at greater risk of at writing. And if they are likely to leave, then this is what you might have to do differently. I think all the people in this particular manager's team are unhappy. So maybe the manager has to be changed. And if you'll save five people in the team, right? So I think yeah. those kind of decisions can be given. Uh, AI can help in analyzing and explaining, but only to, it can't take decisions. I don't think you should allow it to take decisions. This yeah. information, it should just be an additional information that yeah. is given to human, be, to managers who can then take a decision on how to act. Yeah. I see, okay, thank you. And the next question is from Najla Azarin. Uh, the question is, how do we collaborate with AI to create a conductive, optimal, and comprehensive business ecosystem to accelerate company performance? Recalling with that, that AI could display displace human labor and cause unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think it's an important question, and it's real, right? I think every disruptive technology has a huge Im human impact. Even when computers came in, a lot of people who were doing cleric, uh, there was a huge typist pool, a stenographer pool in large organizations that vanished once computers came in. There were so many clerical jobs which went away, but there are new types of jobs that get created and for which people have to upskill. And those who got those skills did very well for themselves. Those who didn't get those skills had to had difficult times. I think that is real of AI, but it is more real of AI than anything else that we have seen in the past. There was study done which showed that 65% of all the work that we do is language related work. And 60% of that can be done by generative AI type tools, which means 40% of our work can be done by AI in theory, but it doesn't mean 40% of the people will lose their jobs it doesn't mean that, it means some people will definitely get displaced, that some people will need new skills and some people will just do more with the tools that are available. I think it is a disruptive technology. It has to be taken seriously and people should find ways of upskilling themselves to remain relevant. It is going to have a human cost, which cannot be avoided by any as it happens with everything disruptive. But there is no way you can stop AI, stop technology and say, it's not like nuclear weapons, right? Where you say that nobody should have nuclear weapons and you can stop it. But AI is easy, they're more difficult to stop. So yeah. there is going to be AI and we have to find ways of uh, remaining relevant in the AI era. I think that's the way I look at it. Okay, thank you, Srida. Um, hello, Miss Najla. Uh, how about the answer from Sida? Is it good for you? Or you need to inquire the question? Okay, thank you, Miss Najla, for answering. Okay. And uh, the next question is from Fadila. As we know, AI is only as good as the data being fed into it. As a result, there may be case where the AI ends up being discriminatory, even though it's been argued that AI is more impartial and less subjective compared to humans. Are there any regulation or initiative in the AI world that fights against this? Yes, absolutely. I think very, very important question. And I think I answered parts of it when I spoke earlier. For instance, in the US, they were starting to use AI 
in courts to take decisions about the length of the sentence should somebody be given a 3 month jail term or a 6 month prison term right and they were taking decisions based on what is the likelihood of this person committing another crime and coming back to prison if the likelihood was high they said this person should get longer sentence if the person is unlikely to do another crime and come back then they should give shorter sentence what they found out was that you know white people were getting short sentence and black people were getting long sentence because of that now they figured out that this is what was happening they figured out that this was because in the past black people are poorer they have less family support so when they come out of prison they don't have any job they don't have anything and therefore they have to go back to a life of crime but and nobody hires somebody who's gone to jail so therefore they end up doing it so what they did was they gave them small amount of money right when they left prison and they ensured that using this they reduced the amount of the number of i mean black people who came back to prison and they because they gave them a little money at the beginning when they left prison they were able to rebuild their lives more easily than when they could not so i think ai can highlight the human biases that exist and it can also offer solutions but if you leave it without supervision it can do a lot of harm so it is important to be aware of the problems that it can cause a lot of unintended consequences can happen but we have to be uh, familiar uh, to be aware and we should have we should not lose complete control i think that's very important yeah. okay okay uh, how about the last two question is it okay sure sure i'm fine okay uh, the question is from ranu i want to ask how we should utilize ai analytic results wisely science may be there a possible glitch in data processing or some data that use for analytic can be guaranteed to be always correct i think mistakes can be done by humans mistakes yeah. are done by machines right it yeah. is not as though when you have a human being taking decisions about candidate selection they make all the right decisions it is not that when human beings are taking decisions on performance they are taking all the right decisions they the reason we take wrong decisions is because of bias if we take or because of lack of knowledge these are two things that of that is the result reason we make mistakes right we make mistakes because we don't have enough data and we take decisions without all the data we make mistakes because we are biased we like certain kinds of people we like somebody might like an extrovert somebody might like an introvert somebody might like someone who speaks uh english very well somebody might like somebody who does math very well so it we all have our bias right but i think with ai what it can do is you can say i don't want this kind of bias you can highlight certain types of bias and prevent it you can ensure that you can give it more data so i feel in the once the ai tools become more sophisticated more used more developed you will find that many of the decisions are much more uh, fair than even when they are taken by human beings i see okay thank you and the last question is i think uh, the question is uh, every hr worry about uh, ai can easily replace the clerical job like uh, you say before how we encourage uh, for those uh, whom to be replaced by ai to develop their skill i think everybody has to you know when i uh, i'm probably older than many people in this group right so when i started working it was believed that whatever i studied in university will be enough for me to build my entire career and that has not been true for me i started off i spent 10 years in manufacturing i spent 10 years in it outsourcing and then i spent 10, 10 odd years in analytics and ai 
And now I'm doing work in public policy and AI, et cetera. So you have to reinvent yourself each to become relevant, which means you have to learn new skills, which means you have to go out of comfort zone. I am doing this kind of work. I am good at this job. I just want this job to exist forever. No, it will not, right? I think that is something that we have to accept and we have to like, you know, learn new skills and remain relevant. I think that's the, that is my suggestion. I know it is difficult. It is, it means for, we need to commit ourselves to lifetime of learning and lifetime of upskilling. If I was able to do it once in 10 years, the young people today may have to do it once in three years. Somebody else may have to do it maybe every two years, right? So I think we have to learn new skills all the time and remain relevant. I think that's, there's no choice. I see. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Sridhar. And uh, I think uh, the last session of this topic is already done. And if I can do some uh, summary for this uh, webinar, data can provide so many things and for support the business. But the highlight is AI should not be used for final decision and should be used for as an input. Uh, please remind all of us uh, the data, uh, the AI is just for an input for final decisions. Uh, thank you, Sridhar, for sharing this topic. It's a pleasure to partner with you today. Here's greeting, yeah, here's greeting for uh, Paresha, CEO from Talent Indonesia, is joining today. Is he still here? Hello, Paresha. Hello, hello, thank you. Hello, thank you, Sridhar, for your uh, presentation. It's really, really good and it's really, really um, open mind and open eyes of AI and data analytics. Thank you very uh, much. And please do write in and uh, with all your other questions, I will look at them. Uh, I know the time is not enough to answer everything. We will answer all the other questions. And anybody who wants to see how we can do an AI journey going forward, please reach out to us uh, through Talentfit Asia and we will sort of uh, at Entomo try and do what we can. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, oh, closing uh, statement. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Sridhar, and thank you, thank Parisha. You. Before we close this webinar, let's take a group photo first. For all audience, please kindly open your camera and group photo will be guided by Zia. Please welcome, Zia. Yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you. Uh, I will count to three and everybody smile. One, two, three. Okay, again. One, two, three. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. Krishna, Ms. Adeline, everyone. Bye. What a good insight, Mr. Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Talent also for your wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, happy thank anniversary, you. Talent Fit. Oh, yes. Thank happy you. anniversary, <laughs> Talent Fit. Long live Talent Fit. Long live Talent Fit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we come to the last session of this webinar. Thank you for Sridhar and TV team. And also thank you for audience for your participation today. Hopefully this topic uh, that we have said today, we could be improve our knowledge about data and AI. Don't forget to follow our social media link in Instagram and TikTok Talent Fit Indonesia. We'll see you at next webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.